Decides 2012, the Christie keynote speech. Here's Mike Schneider. Hello, everybody. I am Mike Schneider. We do welcome you to our special coverage of Governor Christie's keynote speech at the Republican National Convention. Delegates from New Jersey and all around the country are gathered right now in Tampa, Florida, waiting to hear this highly touted address. We're just minutes away from that. But earlier this evening, the convention did make it official, in fact, making Mitt Romney the nominee of the Republican Party for President of the United States of America. And the honor of casting the vote, very interesting. The votes that put Romney over the top and made it official this evening did not go, as is traditional in many cases, to his home state of Massachusetts. That honor went to the delegates from the state of New Jersey. Quite a day for Garden State Republicans. And the governor got things going this morning when he made the rounds of the morning shows. I'll use New Jersey as an illustrative experience about what can happen um, if you stick by your principles and look for ways to solve problems. New Jersey is near the bottom of states in unemployment, 48th in unemployment, 47th in economic growth. Yeah, except that in the last 12 months, George, uh, we're ranked fourth in the country in the terms of the number of private sector jobs that have been created according to CNBC. And that we've had 90,000 new private sector jobs created since I've been governor. Um, this is from a state where we had raised taxes and fees 115 times in eight years and had just stifled our economy. So we're not going to turn that around overnight. But like I've said before, the New Jersey comeback has begun. Unnamed sources said that you did not go for the vice president's position because you didn't want to give up the job of New Jersey governor and you had real fears that you and Mitt Romney could not win. You want to take that on? Yeah, it's just complete garbage. I mean, and the two reporters who wrote the story know me and have my phone number and neither one of them ever called me to ask me about the story or to verify it or debunk it. They just wanted to put something good on the front page in the day this thing was canceled. I hear people talking all the time about female voters. They say, well, what are we going to do specifically to reach out to female voters? Well, the same thing we're going to do to reach out to male voters. I mean, I think it's condescending to women to say that we have to have a different message for women than we have for men. This is the message of our party. I'm going to lay out a message for our party tonight that I think will resonate just as much with women voters as it will with men voters. And the governor should start putting out that message uh, just about, let's see, 25 minutes from now. Scheduled to go on somewhere around 10.30. Uh, that's after the convention hears from uh, Ann Romney, the wife of the Republican Party nominee. But before we hear from the governor this evening, let's check in with our panel of keen political observers, Republican strategist Bill Spadia, Democratic strategist Bill Pascrell III, and the director of the Monmouth University Polling Institute, Patrick Murray. Gentlemen, good of you to all come on in. Uh, we, we talked about this kind of being an unusual day. It hasn't happened since Tom Kane was governor that a, uh, the governor of New Jersey had this honor of going before the Republican National Convention and being the keynote speaker. Uh, but we've seen some numbers as well. Patrick, I'll start with you. They indicate that an awful lot of people in New Jersey don't think that this will necessarily bring home the bacon and, and aren't all that impressed with that. Does, does Christie right now find himself uh, preaching to the choir? Well, let's, let's take the New Jersey part of this first. Uh, I'm not sure that New Jerseyans aren't impressed by this. I, I think you kind of might have misread the numbers. There was Eagleton numbers no, I, out today I, yeah. that said that they don't think, they don't think it's going to have a lasting right. impression on New Jersey's image across the country. Yeah. But 32% said he would enhance it. Only, I think, 32%, 34%. Only 12% said he would, uh, it would hurt New Jersey's image, and those are people who don't right. like Chris Christie. So that means that, uh, and when we asked him, when we asked him about before that, he was... Like I said, yeah. the numbers say that the yeah. people didn't think it was going to help right. that much. Right. But I think they're impressed <laughs> by it, because I think uh, when we yeah. asked about him being keynote, even before he was keynote, yes. in the Monmouth University mm -hmm. poll, we what? found that, that more than six in ten New Jerseyans said it was a good idea to put him up there up front. Mm -hmm. And more New Jerseyans say that he it does help New Jersey's image than hurts it. Uh, so at the end of the day, I think it is good for New Jersey. It's not going to have a lasting impact. It's not going to bring home any bacon for New Jersey. Will it give him a bounce? Uh, Will he come but, home with a bounce for yeah, himself? Yeah, but he's definitely yeah. going to have a bounce in the sense that people are, are going to feel good about him, good about New Jersey. It's not going to have any effect in 2013 if he runs for re-election. I hear, Bill, that, that virtually everybody who can get, you know, the 400 delegates and honorary delegates who are down there from yeah. New Jersey, and every one of them is going to be there tonight. 
They're all going to be there. They Actually, what they did was anybody that had an honorary pass was allowed to get on the floor. And, of course, as you saw today, when, uh, when the votes that put Mitt Romney over the top, uh, the New Jersey delegation is front and center. They can reach out and touch the podium. So, you know, you're going to get yeah. a really energized Republican base coming back to this state. And I think that when you look at Chris Christie's numbers, uh, look, the guy enjoys a relatively high approval rating, considering that this is uh, really a blue state. I mean, I, I don't know that anybody would say, if, if you refer to bringing home the bacon, does that refer to 2013, where I think Governor Christie is the odds-on favorite to win re-election? Does that impact Barack Obama's ability to win this state? No, I, I think Obama is right now going to, you're going to have upside down numbers. You're going to have Chris Christie running high popularity. And I think Obama's still likely to win this Well, the state. interesting thing, Bill, is that you have here the, a, a triple crown of sorts, Christie giving the speech. You get the delegation with the honor of putting him over the, uh, Romney over the top. And for the first time in years, they've got great seats, which is, which is, uh, for any of us who have been to a convention, it's a big deal. One, one could argue, perhaps, that Governor Christie has set up New Jersey very nicely should Mr. Romney win the White House. No question about it. I'm surprised that, Bill, who's been a gentleman, uh, didn't enlighten our audience and let them know that Governor Christie was responsible for the seating. He was responsible for the placement of when the nomination will be put over the top. And tonight's his night. Um, but really tonight, it's not about New Jersey. This is about a governor who's going to be throwing red meat out to his party. And he relishes this opportunity. As I've said on the show before, mm -hmm. Chris Christie is, in my opinion, one of the most adept politicians our state has seen in 40 years or four generations. I believe that. Uh, this is his night. Uh, it's a tremendous honor. Um, and I think those in the media who've tried to cajole him into, why aren't you talking about the comeback? Tonight's not about New Jersey. Um, tonight's about the governor, what he, what he believes his party represents going into the fall. And he's all, also responsible for positioning Governor Romney. Well, he's also, but some would say as well, that in the process, he's also positioning himself very well. And there are those, well, let me, let me go back to you, Bill. Yeah. There are those with serious concerns within the party that, that this uh, political uh, force of nature is very, very likely to make it almost impossible for the nominee of the party or even the vice presidential nominee, who's been highly touted as well, to, to stand up in comparison. To. I don't think so. I, look, Chris Christie delivers one heck of a speech. I think we're going to see vintage Chris Christie tonight. But let's take a step back. You've got a very, very uh, highly accomplished ticket from Mitt Romney to Paul Ryan. These are folks that are accustomed to the national stage and they're ready for prime time. That said, Chris Christie has a very different style. And I think what you're going to see tonight is that Ann Romney, her role, is going to be to a little bit define the man, whereas Chris Christie is going to help define the mission of the party. You know, how do we go into this election? And, and I think you're going to see a lot of positives. You know, Bill mentions the Jersey comeback. I think part of the problem in just focusing on the Jersey comeback is it comes with that negative, that back and forth, that tussle that goes on in Trenton. Tonight is big picture. This is about the mission of the party, uh, maybe more akin to George W. Bush defining compassionate conservatism or Bill Clinton defining hey, it's the economy, stupid. It's a big theme night. But, but Patrick, am, am I fair, in, and you'll tell me if I'm not, of course, uh, am I fair in, in saying that to a certain extent we're seeing here a candidate, though, that needs other people to define him more than most recent candidates? Uh, yeah, I, th I think there's, there's an issue with, uh, we see in the polls, uh, likability, cares, cares about people like me. Our two big numbers in the polls were Mitt Romney has a deficit. Uh, and it's, it's, he's stiff. I mean, there's no way to get about it. Uh, Al Gore had the same problem uh, back in 2000. Uh, this, these are candidates who you feel that there's just no connection to. And uh, same thing, Al Gore had to rely on others to kind of make the case for him that, that he was uh, a human being who really felt and had a drive and whatever. It's, I mean, it's just the way it is. I mean, that, that's, that's, that is, he's going to rely on Paul Ryan to help, you know, give him that, that kind of that spark. Uh, his wife certainly is, has to play a major role uh, and, and painting him as the family man. And you've spoken out on something uh, I, I read in a recent interview, a polling number that is really uh, astonishing, although you said it was almost inevitable that it had to be hit sometime, yeah. that when it comes to African-American support, uh, the Republicans generally lag yeah. with that. 
but this is an all-time low. Well, I mean, there was one poll that had him. Uh, so Mitt Romney had Street zero Street, yeah. among. It was the NBC Wall Street poll. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> it's really zero. unbelievable, though. Yeah, yeah. Right. Zero. 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 So you're talking about a margin of error for that group of African Americans. That's probably five or six or seven points. So it's anywhere from zero to six or seven points. But the rest of us are showing. That, so I'm not, that, that and it's look, traditional. It, yeah, it's traditional. It's, yeah, it's, I know. Historically accurate. Yeah, not, not enough to have an impact on some states where the African American vote might be pivotal. No, well, it's going to be pivotal anywhere. The, the, the real pivotal issue here is in in 2008, 74 percent of the electorate who showed up were white. And the remainder, 26 percent, were not white. Uh, and that, that number is going to be pivotal in terms of the turnout, the, the proportion, because John McCain won the white vote. Barack Obama won the minority vote by such a huge margin that it wiped out uh, John so McCain's more, more signs of polarization, though. I want, to, yeah. I want to pause for a second here because it's, you know, we, we're kind of curious about how the governor went about the process of preparing for this speech. And we also spent the day kind of wondering how New Jersey delegates themselves have been reacting to all the hoopla surrounding them. Our chief political correspondent, Michael Aaron, happens to be in Tampa. When Governor Christie takes the podium tonight, it will be a much anticipated moment in the New Jersey delegation. Some of the delegates told us they're excited. I can't tell you how excited I am and how excited the whole delegation is to hear the governor. That's why our hotel is full. We have over 600 people that came down for this speech and uh, everyone's excited. I, I can't wait to hear what he has to say. If it's, if it's anything like the governor's speech, I'm sure everybody's going to be very impressed. And, uh, as a New Jersey delegate, Republican, I couldn't be prouder to have our governor as a keynote speaker. In a private, no cameras briefing with New Jersey reporters yesterday, Christie said there will be some things new in his keynote speech and some familiar. He said the Romney campaign has read the speech but didn't change a word or comma. He showed it to a tight circle of fewer than 10 people, he said, so he wouldn't be bombarded with suggestions. Christie said he's not worried about coming off as too combative. My number one priority, he said, is sounding like me. Christie said the Romney campaign didn't even make any suggestions for themes in the speech, but several delegates we spoke to would like to see some things. I just want all of, of America to hear what we hear on a daily basis, what the governor's trying to do, really to talk about what the Republican Party, uh, what we're trying to uh, do for America, to bring it back, to save America, in my opinion, uh, because under President Barack, Barack Obama, I do not feel he has American interests at heart. Former Governor Tom Kane, who delivered the keynote in 1988, said he's excited too. Now, it's very rare that a state, you know, it only happens every four years, very rare, rare that a state gets a keynote speaker. I mean, how many have we had? Two in the last century? So this is a, this is a big deal, and I'm very proud of the state and very proud of Chris Christie. This is only the second Republican convention Christie has attended. The other was the year 2000. In 04 and 08, he was U.S. attorney and couldn't attend. Twelve years ago, he could walk the floor unrecognized. Tonight, he's giving the keynote. For NJ Today, I'm Michael Aaron in Tampa. And according to the schedule, the governor should be speaking somewhere in around uh, 20 minutes from now. But right now, as you can see, and we take you live inside the convention hall in Tampa, Florida, that is Ann Romney, the wife of the Republican nominee, the Mitt Romney, in, a, in an equally anticipated speech as well. So much has been said, and we were discussing this just a couple of moments ago, about her pivotal about role in this so campaign and in defining a, a Mitt Romney that many who know him insist that the, those of us who are only covering him or watching him as he goes through the campaign uh, may never really have anticipated what kind of guy he truly is. And, and that maybe is a word that most people wouldn't use when they talk about Romney. Guy, but this is the kind of role that Mrs. Romney has carved out now or has been carved out for her to, to humanize uh, Mitt Romney in a way that many people felt he had not been in his previous run for president or thus far in the Republican primaries as well. Uh, back with our panel once again to uh, to discuss what we uh, anticipate the governor might be addressing as well. But, but let's let's talk about uh, this rather exceptional woman. Uh, she's been through an enormous number of, of health struggles. Um, she has gotten kudos from virtually everybody who's witnessed her as she's gone through this this process as, as well. Uh, how important do you think she is to to your party? 
I think she's she's very important for this reason that that if people respond to her and like her tonight, it's more than what she says. It's a good feeling that they get. I mean, the folks that are watching tonight, uh, you know, a lot of them they, they don't know Mitt Romney. They certainly don't know Ann Romney. And you know, the Republican Party has struggled in in recent, I would say, go back a year to really define themselves nationally. And who are we? And I think tonight's speeches started with an array of Republican governors touting their success, and now we turn a little bit to to that, as yeah. you said, the human side, right. to really personalize Mitt Romney. Because, look, folks can can forgive you if they don't agree with you on 100% of the issues, but they got to like you. Right. And, and I think and, Anne's going to accomplish and that And this, this isn't only a yeah. couple that's been together, married for a long time. They've known yeah. each other since they were children, She knows him best. She knows uh, him best. It's a very important speech. Absolutely. Uh, from a political standpoint, I mean, this is this is your business. When you see a candidate with a wife who carries herself as well, or a spouse, I should say, who carries themselves as well as Ann Romney carries, how, how much of an impact does that have, do you think, when you take a look and you put together a, a race? Well, to be objective about it, I think that uh, John Kerry's wife uh, was a clear liability in 2004, where we were intimately involved in that campaign. Mm -hmm. And uh, as we were approaching our convention, there were some, you know, awkward moments. Um, I think that President Obama has done very well uh, mm -hmm. by his wife. She polls better than he does. It, she's yeah. a <laughs> tremendous asset. So, you know, Patrick, I, am I right about that? <laughs> that is true. Thank you very much. Yes. I think that um, uh, Michelle Obama's uh, accomplished a significant amount of not dabbling, mm -hmm. as some first ladies have over the years in both parties in policy, but talking about issues that she's concerned about, mm -hmm. children's obesity and children's issues and the like. Um, she's been a good mother, she's been a good wife, and I, I believe that Ann Romney is an asset. I think she has a very difficult task ahead of her because I think that the contrast between the president and the Republican nominee couldn't be uh, wider in terms of personality, character, and likability. And, you know, uh, you can't expect that Ann Romney's going to be able to deliver it over the goalpost. Well, one of the interesting things I noticed early this evening as well, Scott Pelley over at CBS did an interview with the Romneys. And uh, at the, towards the end of the interview, he asked her about women's issues. And, and she deflected most of those specifics away and talked about how the economy is the, is the overriding concern for all women at this point and their economic well-being for the family. Uh, is, it, this is, I guess, for a, for a, a, a family uh, in this position right now, running this race, for a, a man whose political record is suspect as being a little bit some would say flip floppy on some of these social issues. They don't have, do they have wiggle room or, or do, what do the polls say they should be doing? Well, there's always a gender, not always, but in, in the past uh, decade or decade and a half, there has been a clear gender gap between Republicans and, and uh, uh, Democrats in terms of who women prefer and men prefer. So and, we're talking and, about the racial divide before the right, gender gap. There is, is a just, gender is gap. The, the issue that you don't, you're not going to shrink that gender gap. You're not going to make it disappear. So what you want to do as a Republican is make sure it doesn't widen. Um, you know, th there's an issue here, here in New Jersey. It was an issue that came up uh, just this summer with a, a, an appeal to women in our Senate race with Joe Carrillos and Bob Menendez and going back and forth. And I looked at the numbers and I said, well, the gender gap is exactly the same as it has been all along. And making an appeal to women doesn't work for Republicans. Yeah, uh, the Republican yeah, Party a, has an just, awful lot You of have it. to make an, an appeal across the board but because yeah, women are, are concerned about about feeding their kids and getting their kids to school and all those things and their, their, their economic issues, and that's where Republicans do best. But if they get distracted by social issues right. like abortion and so forth, that, that hurts Republicans because then it says to women, to women voters, is that, okay, what we think of you as Republicans and why we like Republicans is when you focus on the economic issues. And when you stray away from it, then you lose our vote. What's well, interesting, there was a poll just done for Lifetime Television. Kellyanne Conway, a Republican, and Celinda Lake, who's a Democrat, did this poll for Lifetime. I just saw it today. And they actually, almost echoing what you're saying, 47% of women said economy and jobs, number one issue. So I would say that when you define what is a woman's issue, a woman's issue is the same as a man's issue, same as everybody's issue out there. We need a vibrant economy. We need growth. And uh, we need job creation. So, so I think that you can't parse up different interest groups and try to appeal with but, one but issue. Here's it's one of across the, things, the board. And I'll, I'll let you get in, uh, yeah. uh, Bill Pascrell the third in a second. Uh, Bill Spadia, the, 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 one of the observations from the outside looking in that I've, that I've noticed uh, or that I've had is that your, your party, 
uh, may have trouble getting uh, the votes of some women sometimes in some places. But you've got a lot of prominent women candidates and office holders right now. Yeah, look so, at Governor Nikki Haley. Uh, yeah, we just, just spoke a couple Absolutely. of moments ago Absolutely. as well. And throughout terrific. the course of the yeah. entire day, there's been one after another. Why do you think the party then can offer up what many consider to be very attractive, effective candidates, but has trouble bringing more women well, into the tent. I, I don't know that they have trouble bringing women to the tent. I think that if you define this in the broad stroke of a national poll, mm -hmm. then it will skew the numbers. Really, when we look at a national election, it is a state by state, district by district election. And I would say where you look at states where Republicans do well, they've got that gender gap closed. Do you secretly hope, or not so secretly hope, <laughs> that, that Christie can, can ascend to, the, to these, you know, magnanimous heights uh, because it would take your party back to the middle on some of these social issues? I don't know if it's about being taken back to the middle. I think it's about defining the mission, as we said earlier. He's got to, he's got to go after the core issue that's running through the country today, that is the economy and jobs. We've had 41 months of over 8% unemployment. That's hanging heavy on people's minds, and Chris Christie has an opportunity to redefine it. Hold on, Pat. Do, you, do Democrats secretly dread the notion that the Republicans might be able to build that, their own big tent, pull, pull back to the middle on some, some issues, keep enough conservatives happy long enough to, to have their own big tent party. I don't uh, think we dread it at all, uh, because I think we represent what America is looking for. And uh, there's three issues that I think the Republicans have a very difficult task ahead of them on. One is the, and I hate this phrase, but just so I don't have to go on uh, ad nauseum, the etch-a-sketch issue or the flip-flop mm -hmm. issue, okay? Americans are smarter than that. Mitt Romney has a record. He's not very likable according to the mm -hmm. polling data, so he's got to work on that. Two, I think a lot of Americans are resentful of both parties right now. They may be disappointed in President Obama's inability to turn around a global recession, but they're also disappointed that two months after he took office, the leader then of the Republican Party, Mitch McConnell, said his number one goal was to defeat the president. How do you make that determination, Michael, after 60 days of the, the new president being in office? I think I'm hearing that on the streets of our state and when I cross the country and talk to my friends. And finally, the third issue is, Every time the president has tried to put forward a proactive initiative on the economy, just because it comes from his desk, it's been no. People are smarter than this. Obama's been a disappointment to many of us because the issues were so monumental and Herculean to overcome. And he hasn't been able to overcome them. Unemployment's still high. But imagine this. We have high unemployment and a president that's neck and neck in a very difficult time. I think that says a lot about Bill's party's nominee. Well, the, the, Patrick, you wanted to jump in a moment ago. Well, I was, I was going to say something about Chris Christie, but, uh, well, well, go ahead. but, on, <laughs> that, but on this, uh, but on, on this Don't issue... Don't hold back. Yeah, this is, this, is, this is an important issue about the parties because I think what we're, we have a sense is the reason why neither party can hold on to control of either chamber or the presidency for more than a, the, than a term is because the public doesn't see that either party really is putting up the leadership that's necessary. And to give you, uh, a, a, just to pull one instance out of a hat with, with President Obama, was remember when, when he wanted to put together the health care plan and he, he got all these congressional leaders around the table in the White House and the idea was that you were supposed to come to the table with ideas, and then we put the best ones together. And what happened is the Republicans came to that table with whining and complaining about everything that happened in the past. The Democrats were whining and complaining as they were complaining and trying to defend them, and they walked out of there with nothing. And, and President Obama did not lead that session and say, look, if you're not, if this, is the, this is the agenda. If you're not following the agenda, get out of the room, which is something that I think we're going to see a contrast with tonight with Chris Christie's speech. This is a guy who can be a leader, who can lead across the aisle, and I think that's why he's popular in a blue state, well, is because it's not that we agree with everything that he's done, but at least he says, look, this is, these are the rules of the game. I got elected governor. We play by these rules. Or you, you go off and do your own thing. Yet uh, today I had uh, Assemblyman Wisniewski on, and the Democrats have been very, very vocal right now about the, 
they, that Christie is, is more flash than substance, that Christie has actually taken a lot of issues that some of which were Steve Sweeney's and that he's co-opted them, that he's only bipartisan when he has to be, and that the, the, the state is a mess in, in ways that he would not want to admit tonight, certainly, but that others see from unemployment to jobs problems, things like that. Well, I mean, the, the uh, fact is, that, is that there, our debt is still there a grows disconnect is, is, is between, a between what, what the governor would have us believe about the comeback uh, and between the rhetoric and the reality? Of course there is. Yeah. There, I mean, there, there has to be. Uh, but the governor is very adept at saying that at the, at, the, at the end of the day, this is the direction I'm taking this state. You know, you get on board the train or, for, you know, I won't deal with it. My you. way, the highway. Yeah, exactly. But he didn't and then with pension reform, though. I mean, look, no, he, he went that across was, the that aisle. Why did he go didn't across? Do this was this was what Mark either, was just saying. You know? that, was, that was Steve Sweeney's idea. Mm -hmm. But you get to take credit. Uh, you get but, to take but, credit but for it when you're the governor. Well, maybe the final bill came out of Steve Sweeney. But let's face no, it, Steve the Sweeney governor was ran back in 2006. I mean, I'm not defending here. I'm doing bill bill bill. Look, the governor. I really appreciate it. With respect, the governor ran on entitlement reform the same way Scott Walker did, the same way Bob McConnell did. And I think if you listen to some of the speeches tonight. Specifically, John Kasich talked in Ohio. Scott Walker talked about this. Bob McConnell talked about it, that when you go across the country, 12 of the 15 states that were labeled great for business, Republican governors. You seven, that I, but, I did, but, but, but it was let a great me, Let me raise a point there, because you raised, because yeah. I know some yeah. of those guys, you yeah. covered them, worked with a few of them uh, way back when as well. The difference, this is, and this probably plays into what Christie's message has been and continues to be, the difference is, is that those guys generally are at war with their part with the Democratic Party in most states most of the time, and Christie tends not to be. Well, if 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 I may, Bill, I I think I don't think the governor's going to go there tonight. But I think that the governor has a great story to tell. Yeah. Whether I like it or not, <laughs> or whether I'm frustrated as a yeah. Democrat or not, that's not what tonight's about. Okay, the fact of the matter is he's worked with a very strong Democratic legislature. And leadership, and he got himself he's, elected in a state where he's got accomplished a big hill to overcome. Right? Michael, my point is, yep. I think that's what America is yearning for. The, the so Congress he's on to something here. To right. work this with the bipartisan and this leadership. is where the Romney leadership. has leadership. missed the boat. Right. It's he's missed the boat. Well, yet, 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 this, this is yet, this is why the polls are showing a really Hold on, guys. Hold on. This is where I would go back though and say. But he did almost the same thing in Massachusetts. But that's in Massachusetts. The, Absolutely, Michael, blue Michael state. that's the point. You know it because you're a student of this and you watch it and you've reported on it. We know it because it's our business. The American people don't know what he did. Remember when but, George Bush but, ran for president? He talked about the Texas legislature that he right, got a lot of right. things accomplished with. Right. And yeah. people didn't give George right. Bush but, that gravitas. We know, Mitt, we, know Mitt Romney from Romney. we know Mitt Romney from 2008. That's how the country right. knows Mitt Romney. Mitt Romney by but his campaign's own admission, that's tried to be everything to everybody. That's right. why we and that's, have these that's events. what we have this, this issue right, right. now right. with <laughs> two <laughs> candidates, the, the incumbent president and his Republican challenger, who the, the public feel lack leadership. But, I but don't know that that's it. true. I don't know that that's true at all. I, I think that, look, Mitt Romney had a very successful career as governor of Massachusetts, did it in a blue state, did it with a legislature that was far more Democratic than what, what Chris Christie had. was successful? Wait a minute, wait. But what, let, what? The people at home want it. Why do Be you think because his governorship was successful? Unemployment rate in Massachusetts was 4% when he was governor. Okay. And it has since gone up right, on so, Deval Patrick but, and others. So so my, my point is but, but, that he, he didn't have, have any major success. Are we, wait, are we baiting on health care? Is that what we're talking about? <laughs> <laughs> it's a preview of what's to come. The, I mean, the, listen, listen, this is this is about you how know, many videos wait, 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 did he have? Let's go when back to that. Going. Let's go back to that poll. Jobs in the economy, number one issue among women, among men, among voters in general, likely voters, registered voters, jobs in the economy. Chris Christie is able to define that as something very, very, not only something that he accomplished while as governor, because we had the two highest. Um, uh, months for employment in May and June of this year in 12 years in New Jersey. The comeback is real. Well, uh, well we're not talking about the comeback. Well, sure That's not what we're, the governor's not talking about it either. What we're yeah. talking about tonight well, maybe he'll surprise is what you. the American <laughs> people are looking for and how Chris Christie's going to try to... Listen, the fact of the matter is, is that Romney's been running for president for the last eight years. Yes. He's been running for president almost longer than the current president, if you think about it, when he declared versus when Obama declared. But let's put that aside. Right. What is his plan? Ask the American people, what is his plan to turn the economy around? 
All I know is I'm not going to do what Barack Obama's done. <laughs> but what are you going to do? But that's what the governor's speech is about tonight. The governor's speech has got to be about the broad stroke about how are we going to create jobs? How are we going to reduce the regulatory burden? Why does Chris Christie have to give that burden? speech? No, it's well, wait a minute. Now, wait a minute. It's, it's, it's about, <laughs> not about, it's about it's broad, it's job. Wait a minute. Let, let it's Patrick about jump broad in here. strokes yeah. about defining the mission of the Republican Party. Well, that's, Absolutely. That's, it's going but to that, be, but that's part of it. It's going to be yeah. a party of making yeah. hard choices. That's, that's sure. the key. I mean, there's not going to be any specifics in it. But what he has to do is he has to paint Mitt Romney as a leader. All these things we've just been talking about. Right. This is his big weakness. Uh, you know, one of the things that, that, that's, that struck me um, when uh, the, the governor's been making the rounds recently on, you know, with the radio and, and, and his press conferences. So he's been talking about, people asked him, what do you want people to know about New Jersey? And he said, well, we're a country that, we're, we're a state that tells the truth. And you go around New Jersey, we tell, reminds me of my wife's Aunt Rita up in Hoboken, <laughs> who lived up in Hoboken, rest her soul. Aunt Rita story Aunt Rita story. Every story started with, I tell the truth, I don't tell a lie. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's what he wants to, you know, paint New Jersey. I, the other thing that I think about that he used to say, um, you know, I went to I went to Trenton to provide adult supervision. So, mm -hmm. and I think that what he's going to try have to do is to transfer that to yeah, Mitt Romney right. in that speech. Let me, let me ask speech. you guys something. One of the things, the interesting things that came up today was what happened to the Ron Paul delegates. Mm. Interesting for those of you watching at home, uh, you, you know what I'm going to talk about. And if you didn't watch, when they did, they actually uh, broke with tradition as well. They had the roll call. This afternoon, which was usually the, the star attraction right. event, right. Uh, you know, a, a couple of nights into it. But, but today they went, ran through it. And usually, you know, what happens is that somebody gets up and says, Madam Chairman, you know, uh, the great state of New Jersey cast 42 votes for so-and-so and, and eight votes for such-and-such. And, such. and then the Madam Chairman at the top of the, uh, at the uh, lectern will say, uh, it's 42 votes for so-and-so and eight votes for such-and-such. Such. But today, all they said was that's 40, you know, 42 votes for Romney. And they didn't even mention... The Ron Paul stuff, and some members of the main delegation, among others, I'm told, Ron Paul delegates, walked out. It's too cute. Walked Michael. out. It's too cute. Why? Why? I mean, does yeah, this yeah, does say something? It, it, why yeah. did they do it? Because yeah. they're they're yeah. Romney's campaign. I will give credit to has been tremendous for the most part at sticking to message. There, there is an incredible discipline not to show any division. Or, I want to, or, uh, hold on a second, Bill. I want to take, if we can, switch to the uh, campaign, uh, to the uh, convention hall right now, if we can, guys, and just take a, a, a look in. Uh, Governor Christie uh, is set to be speaking any moment now. Uh, Ann Romney just finished speaking, and uh, Governor Romney uh, just came out to an uh, overwhelming ovation there. This was a very, very uh, keenly anticipated speech as well. Uh, she has been, uh, as we mentioned earlier in the broadcast, a, a woman who has survived breast cancer. Uh, she's battling multiple sclerosis. Uh, had a number of miscarriages as well, so she's she's certainly battled, uh, you know, health challenges along the way, and she has been considered to be a vital, uh, key element to uh, introducing Mitt Romney to the United States of America. Let's take a look right now. They're going to bring out Governor Christie any moment right now, and the Republican Party has a number of of uh, videos and presentations that they put together to to introduce a man that we know very well from uh, from our home state here. Uh, uh, Governor Christie will be speaking, we're told, for somewhere in the neighborhood of about uh, 20 minutes or so to 30 minutes. Uh, and essentially, we've been told by the governor through a series of interviews and through uh, a number of uh, of remarks that he's made that he does not intend to talk about the New Jersey comeback per se, although advanced copies of the speech indicate that uh, the Garden State will play a, a crucial role in what he has to say tonight and, and uh, a predicate for what he envisions the uh, governing uh, of, a, of a Romney administration would ultimately mean for this country as well. Uh, Chris Christie, uh, he was up on the lectern early this morning. You know, the candidates, when they come to these conventions, uh, all of them who are lucky enough to get the nomination do this, and the keynote speakers and other key speakers as well, are, are taken up to the podium where they will speak, and they are given the opportunity to, uh, to scope out what the hall looks like and to see where the teleprompter is. And, and believe me, President Obama is not the only candidate or, or official that uses a teleprompter for most of his speeches. But they're getting, given a chance to just start to get comfortable with what they will be working amongst and within. And that exactly is what happened with uh, Governor Christie and uh, Mary Pat. You can see some of the photos that were taken as he went through this experience. And he, and he reflected upon the extraordinary uh, transition that's gone through uh, 
you know, his life and his family's life uh, as well over these past several years. This has gone from being a, a, a gentleman who uh, had considerable success as a U.S. attorney and suddenly found himself uh, as the chief executive of the Garden State and uh, thrust into a position of key prominence uh, in very, very short order. Uh, panel members, before we go back and actually listen to the governor speak, uh, if, if you're Chris Christie right now, what's going through your mind, do you think? Do you, are you thinking policy? Are you thinking performance? No, are you, are you uh, just there? Knowing Chris Christie, he's going to say, this is going to be fun. Yeah, <laughs> I think he's, he's in <laughs> yeah. the moment, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah, you absolutely. saw his speech this morning to the Michigan delegation. He's having fun. He's clearly soaking it all in. He's enjoying the moment in the sun. And, and I'll tell you, I think he's a, he, look, he's a serious man. He's a serious leader. He understands the role that he's got to play tonight. He's a bit of a natural, isn't he? Yeah. I think it's just uh, like walking out before you walk out onto a field mm -hmm. uh, for a major game. Yeah. Yeah. This is the Super Bowl, perhaps, for politics or yeah. leading up to it. I think his adrenaline, his heart is pumping. And, and I'm going to interrupt he's ready because for uh, there is the governor of the state of New Jersey, the keynote speaker, he's Governor right. Chris Christie. Let's listen in. Thank you. Well, this stage and this moment are very improbable for me. A New Jersey Republican <laughs> delivering the keynote address to our national convention. From a state, from a state with 700,000 more Democrats than Republicans. A New Jersey Republican stands before you tonight. Proud of my party, proud of my state, and proud of my country. Now, now I am the son of an Irish father and a Sicilian mother. My dad, who I'm blessed to have here with me tonight, is gregarious, outgoing, and lovable. My mom, who I lost eight years ago, was the enforcer. <laughs> now, she made sure we all knew who set the rules. Tell it to you this way, in the automobile of life, dad was just a passenger, mom was the driver. <laughs> now, they both lived hard lives. Dad grew up in poverty. And after returning from Army service, he worked at the Briars Ice Cream Plant in the 1950s. Now, with that job and the GI Bill, he put himself through Rutgers University at night to become the first in his family to earn a college degree. And our, our first family picture, our first family picture was on his graduation day, with my mom beaming next to him, six months pregnant with me. Now, mom also came from nothing. She was raised by a single mother who took three different buses every day to get to work. And mom spent the time that she was supposed to be a kid actually raising children, her younger brother and younger sister. She was tough as nails and didn't suffer fools at all. And the truth was, she couldn't afford to. She spoke the truth, bluntly, directly, and without much varnish. I am her son. I was her son. I was her son as I listened to Darkness on the Edge of Town with my high school friends on the Jersey Shore. I, I, I was her son when I moved into that studio apartment with Mary Pat to start a marriage that's now 26 years old. I was her son as I coached our sons, Andrew and Patrick, on the fields of Mendham, and as I watched with pride as our daughters, Sarah and Bridget, marched with their soccer teams in the Labor Day Parade. And I'm still her son today as governor, following the rules she taught me to speak from the heart and to fight for your principles. You see, mom never thought you'd get extra credit just for speaking the truth. 
And the greatest lesson that mom ever taught me, though, was this one. She told me there would be times in your life when you have to choose between being loved and being respected. Now, she said to always pick being respected. She told me that love without respect was always fleeting, but that respect could grow into real and lasting love. Now, of course, she was talking about women. <laughs> but, but I've learned over time that it applies just as much to leadership. In fact, I think that advice applies to America more than ever today. You see, see, I believe we have become paralyzed, paralyzed by our desire to be loved. Now, our founding fathers had the wisdom to know that social acceptance and popularity were fleeting, and that this country's principles needed to be rooted in strains greater than the passions and the emotions of the times. But our leaders today have decided it's more important to be popular, to be popular, to say and do what's easy, and say yes rather than to say no, when no is what is required. And in recent years, in recent years, we as a country have too often chosen the same path. It's been easy for our leaders to say, not us, not now, in taking on the really tough issues. And unfortunately, we've stood silently by and let them get away with it. But tonight, I say enough. Tonight, tonight I say together, let's make a much different choice. Tonight we are speaking up for ourselves and stepping up. Tonight we're beginning to do what is right and what is necessary to make America great again. We are demanding that our leaders stop tearing each other down and work together to take action on the big things facing America. Tonight, we are going to do what my mother taught me. Tonight, we're going to choose respect over love. See, we're not afraid. We are not afraid. We're taking our country back because we are the great-grandchildren of the men and women who broke their backs in the name of American ingenuity, the grandchildren of the greatest generation, the sons and daughters of immigrants, the brothers and sisters of everyday heroes, the neighbors of entrepreneurs and firefighters, teachers and farmers, veterans and factory workers, and everyone in between who shows up not just on the big days or the good days, but on the bad days and the hard days each and every day all 365 of them. You see, we are the United States of America. Now, 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 it's up to us. We must lead the way our citizens live. To lead as my mother insisted I live not by avoiding truths, especially the hard ones, but by facing up to them and being better for it. We can't afford to do anything less. Now, I know this because this was the challenge in New Jersey. When I came into office, I could continue on the same path that led to wealth and jobs and people leaving our state, or I could do the job people elected me to do, to do the big things. Now, there were those who said it couldn't be done that the problems were too big, too politically charged, and too broken to fix. But we were on a path we could no longer afford to follow. Now, they said it was impossible, this is what they told me, to cut taxes in a state where taxes were raised 115 times in the eight years before I became governor. That it was impossible to balance a budget at the same time with an $11 billion deficit, but three years later, we have three balanced budgets in a row with lower taxes. We did it. They said, they said it was impossible to touch the third rail of politics, 
to take on the public sector unions and to reform a pension and health benefits system that was headed to bankruptcy. But with bipartisan leadership, we saved taxpayers $132 billion over 30 years and saved retirees their pensions. We did it. They said, they said it was impossible to speak the truth to the teachers' union. They were just too powerful. A real teacher tenure reform that demands accountability and ends the guarantee of a job for life regardless of performance. They said it would never happen. But for the first time in 100 years, with bipartisan support, you know the answer, we did it. Now, now, the disciples of yesterday's politics, they always underestimate the will of the people. They assumed our people were selfish, that when told of the difficult problems, the tough choices, and the complicated solutions, that they would simply turn their backs, that they would decide it was every man for himself. They were wrong. The people of New Jersey stepped up. They shared in the sacrifice. And you know what else they did? They rewarded politicians who led instead of politicians who pandered. But you know, we shouldn't be surprised. We shouldn't be surprised. We've never been a country to shy away from the truth. Our history shows that we stand up when it counts. And it's this quality that has defined America's character and our significance in the world. Now. I know this simple truth, and I am not afraid to say it. Our ideas are right for America, and their ideas have failed America. Let me be clear with the American people tonight. Here's what we believe as Republicans and what they believe as Democrats. We believe in telling hardworking families the truth about our country's fiscal realities, telling them what they already know. The math of federal spending does not add up. With $5 trillion in debt added over the last four years, we have no other option but to make the hard choices, cut federal spending, and fundamentally reduce the size of this government. Want to know what they believe? They believe that the American people don't want to hear the truth about the extent of our fiscal difficulties. They believe the American people need to be coddled by big government. They believe the American people are content to live the lie with them. They're wrong. We believe in telling our seniors the truth about our overburdened entitlements. We know seniors not only want these programs to survive, but they just as badly want them secured for their grandchildren. Our seniors are not selfish. Here's what they believe. They believe seniors will always put themselves ahead of their grandchildren. And here's what they do. They prey on their vulnerabilities and scare them with misinformation for the single, cynical purpose of winning the next election. Here's their plan. Whistle a happy tune while driving us off the fiscal cliff, as long as they are behind the wheel of power when we fall. Now, we believe that the majority of teachers in America know our system must be reformed to put students first so that America can compete. Now, teachers don't teach to become rich or famous. They teach because they love children. We believe We believe that we should honor and reward the good ones while doing what's best for our nation's future, demanding accountability, demanding higher standards, and demanding the best teacher in every classroom in America.
get ready. Get ready. Here's what they believe. They believe the educational establishment will always put themselves ahead of children. That self-interest will always trump common sense. They believe in pitting unions against teachers, educators against parents, lobbyists against children. They believe in teachers' unions. We believe in teachers. We believe, we believe that if we tell the people the truth, that they will act bigger than the pettiness we see in Washington, D.C. We believe it's possible to forge bipartisan compromise and stand up for our conservative principles. You see, because it's always been the power of our ideas, not our rhetoric, that attracts people to our party. We win when we make it about what needs to be done. We lose when we play along with their game of scaring and dividing. For, for make no mistake about it, everybody, the problems are too big to let the American people lose. The slowest economic recovery in decades, a spiraling out of control deficit, and an education system that's failing to compete in the world. It doesn't matter how we got here. There's enough blame to go around. What matters is what we do now. See, I know, I know we can fix our problems. When there are people in the room who care more about doing the job they were elected to do than they worry about winning re-election, it's possible to work together, achieve principled compromise, and get results for the people who gave us these jobs in the first place. The people have no patience for any other way anymore. It's simple. We need politicians to care more about doing something and less about being something. Yeah. Amen. And, and believe me, believe me, if we could do this in a blue state like New Jersey with a conservative Republican governor, Washington, D.C. is out of excuses. Leadership delivers. Leadership counts. Leadership matters. And here's the great news I came here tonight to bring you. We have this leader for America. We have a nominee who will tell us the truth and who will lead with conviction. And now he has a running mate who will do the same. We have Governor Mitt Romney and Congressman Paul Ryan, and we need to make him the next president and vice president of the United States. You see, because I know Mitt Romney. I know Mitt Romney, and Mitt Romney will tell us the hard truths we need to hear to put us back on a path to growth and create good-paying private sector jobs again in America. Mitt Romney will tell us the hard truths we need to hear to end the torrent of debt that is compromising our future and burying our economy. Mitt Romney will tell us the hard truths we need to hear to end the debacle of putting the world's greatest health care system in the hands of federal bureaucrats and putting those bureaucrats between an American citizen and her doctor. Now, we ended an era of absentee leadership without purpose or principle in New Jersey. I'm here to tell you tonight, it is time to end this era of absentee leadership in the Oval Office and send real leaders back to the White House. America needs Mitt Romney and Paul Ryan, and we need them right now. Now, but we've got to tell each other the truth, right? 
Listen, there is doubt and fear for our future in every corner of our country. I have traveled all the country and I've seen this myself. These feelings are real. This moment is real. And it's a moment like this where some skeptics wonder if American greatness is over. They wonder how those who have come before us had the spirit and the tenacity to lead America to a new era of greatness in the face of challenge. Not to look around and say, not me, but to look around and say, yes, me. Now, I have an answer tonight for the skeptics and the naysayers, the dividers and the defenders of the status quo. I have faith in us. I know. I know we can be the men and women our country calls on us to be tonight. I believe in America and our history. And there's only one thing missing now, leadership. It takes leadership that you don't get from reading a poll. You see, Mr. President, real leaders don't follow polls. Real leaders change polls. And that's what we need. That's what we need to do now. We need to change polls through the power of our principles. We need to change polls through the strength of our convictions. Tonight, our duty is to tell the American people the truth. Our problems are big and the solutions will not be painless. We all must share in the sacrifice. And any leader that tells us differently is simply not telling the truth. Now, I think tonight, I think tonight of the greatest generation, we look back and marvel at their courage, overcoming the Great Depression, fighting Nazi tyranny, standing up for freedom around the world. Well, now it's our time to answer history's call. For make no mistake, every generation will be judged, and so will we. And what will our children and grandchildren say of us? Will they say we buried our heads in the sand? We assuaged ourselves with the creature comforts we've acquired? that our problems were too big and we were too small, that someone else should make a difference because we can't? Or will they say of us that we stood up and made the tough choices that needed to be made to preserve our way of life? You see, I don't know about you, but I don't want my children and grandchildren to have to read in a history book what it was like to live in an American century. I don't want their only inheritance to be an enormous government that has overtaxed, overspent, and overborrowed a great people into second-class citizenship. I want them to live in a second American century. A second American century. A second American century of strong economic growth where those who are willing to work hard will have good paying jobs to support their families and reach their dreams. A second American century where real American exceptionalism is not a political punchline, but is evident to everyone in the world just by watching the way our government conducts its business every day and the way Americans live their lives. A second American century where our military is strong, our values are sure, our work ethic is unmatched, and our Constitution remains a model for anyone in the world struggling for liberty. Let us choose a path that will be remembered for generations to come. Standing strong for freedom will make the next century as great an American century as the last one. You see, this is the American way. We have never been victims of destiny. We have always been the masters of our own. And I know, I know you agree with me on this. I will not be part of the generation that fails that test, and neither will you. All right. All right. It's now time to stand up. Let's stand up. Everybody stand up. Stand up. Because there's no time left to waste. If you're willing to stand up with me for America's future, I will stand up with you. If you're willing to fight with me for Mitt Romney, I will fight with you. If you're willing to hear the truth, to hear the truth about the hard road ahead and the rewards for America that truth will bear, 
I'm here to begin with you this new era of truth-telling. Tonight, we choose the path that has always defined our nation's history. Tonight, we finally and firmly answer the call that so many generations have had the courage to answer before us. Tonight, we stand up for Mitt Romney as the next President of the United States, and together, And together, and together, everybody, together, we will stand up once again for American greatness for our children and grandchildren. God bless you and God bless America. And so there you have it. He spoke for approximately 25 minutes. Governor Christie now receiving a rather substantial amount of applause, as he did throughout the course of his speech. The keynote speech from the Republican National Convention, Chris Christie on stage, and uh, a somewhat unusual scene there. The, uh, the nominee, Mitt Romney, in the hall alongside his wife to actually hear the accolades uh, being delivered to him by the man that he handpicked to be his keynote speaker. This is uh, coming to you live from inside the convention hall at Tampa, Florida. Earlier in the evening, by the way, and we can come back to the studio right now if you would, gentlemen, the, uh, Mitt Romney was officially nominated by the Republican Party there. Some interesting intrigue surrounding what happened to uh, the uh, delegates who had been pledged to in the uh, course of the primary to uh, Ron Paul. We'll talk about that a little more with our panel as we continue our coverage here. Uh, and, and also some uh, fascinating aspects in terms of what the president had to say about what you just heard. Uh, actually, he had something to say before we heard what Mr. Uh, Governor Christie had to say. Uh, I'm told that uh, it's being reported now that President Obama uh, decided to uh, take to his Twitter account and issue some tweets uh, taking some shots at the job creation and unemployment record of both the Republican nominee, uh, Mitt Romney, when he was governor of the state of Massachusetts, and Governor Christie as well, pointing out that during his uh, term, according to the president, Mitt Romney's Massachusetts uh, was 47th in America in terms of job creation, and that as of late, uh, the state of New Jersey under Governor Christie has come in 48th. Uh, and the unemployment rate, uh, as we've reported here on NJ Today over the course of the last several weeks, has now uh, hit the highest mark it's hit in some 30 years. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about what the president had to say in a moment, but first back with our panel. Uh, let's just talk about the speech itself. It was um, 25 minutes in length or so. It was punctuated frequently by applause. It was delivered by uh, a Chris Christie we all have known and covered and watched for a number of years right now. Uh, let's start with you, Bill Pascrell III. What did you think? Well, I think he started out uh, tremendously as um, you know, those of us who were born and raised in New Jersey, who uh, happen to be proud of our Jersey roots and travel the country, uh, are often looked uh, a little askance when our brethren in the South and the West see us on a beach or whatever. You know, we're Jersey guys and gals. I like the beginning. Um, it took him 18 minutes to mention the nominee's name. Um, I've forgotten it, so I mean, <laughs> it, it, I mean, it was a speech about Chris Christie. It was true Chris Christie. There are those who I was following uh, tweets while I was listening to the speech, and listen, it, it's pretty much pretty divided. If you're a hardcore D, you didn't like it. If you're a hardcore R, I think you loved it. The question the is... Well, I mean, that we watched the same speech. Well, I think we did. <laughs> the fact of the matter is, I had a, a, a young member of my family, I don't want to embarrass her, who said, Why is he yelling at me? <laughs> so, Bill, this is Bill, vintage Bill Chris Spader. Christie. Yes. I mean, this is, you know, Chris Christie has this forceful enthusiasm that is so completely different from the very staged teleprompter uh, polit pol politicos that we get today. This guy speaks to the crowd to the point where at the end he said, you know, stand up. I guess just in case I don't get a standing ovation, I'm going to tell you to stand. <laughs> he, you know, he's, got this, he's got this force about him that I think he delivered uh, a positive message, but he put it in, in 
context of this election. He was able to weave in some of the successes in New Jersey. And what's most interesting about Chris Christie is he comes off as a very conservative Republican, but he's talking about entitlement reform. So a very good contrast with what people would usually label the right and say, boy, you know, those right wingers, they just want to take away your entitlements. Not so. We want to fix it now so we have it later. And I think he delivered that very effectively. Well, one of the things I want to point out, because I've, I've covered more than my share of conventions, and what I've noticed over the over the some odd, you know, conventions between 1980 and now, is that there was an evolution in terms of performance art. The, you know, giving a speech is is different than just reading a teleprompter into a camera or something like that. Some guys play it straight to the camera. The new school candidates will look straight yeah. into the camera, ignore the hall, essentially, realizing that the votes right. are out there at home. This guy, this governor, <laughs> yeah. he is old school in, yeah. in his approach, which is he wants that hall to rock as well. Maybe it's all the Springsteen concerts <laughs> he's gone to over the year. But he's playing to the hall as well. And but maybe, in maybe that, in his philosophy, maybe, and maybe we're going the same road here, he's figuring that that will translate through him, the tube to the right. house. Yeah. Yes, it's exactly it. It's that he has this ability to, you know, I think it's he leans to one side, kind of leans on the podium a little bit. Um, so he looks like he's natural. So he looks like we're looking in on him having a conversation. Yeah. Uh, so it works well on TV. It's, it's funny because you mentioned that because the other day I was watching uh, Dwight Eisenhower's 1956 acceptance speech for his renomination for president, and it's, uh, yeah, I fall asleep on that one. Um, yeah, so things have, things certainly have changed. You yeah, you're talking the, about you're talking the about the viewers or Ike himself. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but, Chris, Chris right, but, but you saw you saw that with the yeah. backgrounds changing mm -hmm. and the pictures coming up and well, all that stuff. It's much more highly produced right now. Oh, yeah. I mean, and, but the, the, yeah. these are you know these are stage productions now. Yeah. Nothing nothing actually real happens in the conventions in terms of making a decision. Well, it's been called. Oh, it's I mean, the big infomercials. Yeah. And, and, and that's fine. That's fine. Process though. I mean, you know, but you're right. I mean, the convention is essentially a commercial. But look, Chris. Christie is a leader, he's not a talking head. And I think that's the difference. This is a guy that, you know, he he bleeds this stuff. He breathes it every single day. He's working hard, sleeping. But there's a point, there's a point about the content tonight. of the speech yeah. that we didn't get to. Well, the speech was still, three parts. Yeah, that's, and and exactly. one part was mom and dad. Yeah. The other part was home state Jersey. Then he's yeah. going into the national, and then there's a, part 3A, which is mm -hmm. Romney. Uh, which I guess illustrates your point earlier this evening as well. But he he basically had a a, a stream of consciousness that flowed through right. if those you took, parts. Yeah, if you, and it, it, they were linked very well. But if you took the middle 15 minutes of that speech, uh, that was really the keynote speech that Mitt Romney wanted to hear. Mm -hmm. It started with, okay, this is what the Republicans stand for, right. and as I've shown in New Jersey, here's some examples about how we can do that. These are ideas, these are great ideas. We show leadership, Mitt Romney is that kind of leader. We need Mitt Romney as, as that leader. He will tell us the hard truths. That was great. The beginning and the end was, this is Chris Christie. But don't and, you think, and it was weird because you, even at the end when he said, you know, stand, when he said, stand up with me, yeah. and I'll, I will stand up for, for you. I'm yeah. like, wait, you're not, the, you're not the guy yeah. who's running. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. But, but so there was a little bit of that. The message. Yeah. And, and I think that, you, yeah. you know, in order to, to be successful in communicating that middle, if we give you that middle part, you've got to establish the credibility. And I think he did that. And, you know, and you have to paint with a broad brush. I mean, there's a guy that essentially defined now what this second American century is going to be. It had yeah. to happen. The party needs to now rally behind but, this, and I think they will. But, but I would argue that Chris Christie had a very difficult job tonight. I think he, the speech was a great speech. Yeah. It was red meat for the masses in your party, and he was well received. Two things, though. I don't believe, I'm trying to be objective here, as objective as a Democrat can be, I don't think his connectors were there in that he did not connect his message to Romney. He sort of said, here's what I've that. done and what I believe in, and then threw out, you know, and Mitt Romney. Where's the, what in, in his life experiences, and Christie's had many, right? He's a family guy. He loves his kids. He loves baseball. He loves Springsteen. His human Fam side came out very clearly. I don't tonight. think he connected that to Romney yeah. in a way so, that's going to have a lot of So, so, so basically, you're saying then that. what yeah. Christie was saying is this is all the stuff I'll do one day. Vote for him <laughs> <Yeah>. now? <laughs>
<laughs> well, we need to change. I, they're remember, so That's why bad. I said, Bill, if, if he had cut out the first five minutes and the last five minutes and only delivered that middle 15 minutes, uh -huh. I think you'd have a different impression. I agree. But you know I what? agree. And, yeah. and the Democrats would have liked it. Yeah. There was a gap. And the rest of the country yeah. would have fallen asleep. Let, let me it ask you this. Let me ask you this. Chris Christie. I, I haven't seen many nominees there to witness the keynote address. Never, never happened. Because I mean, they haven't been nominated. And I remember, for the keynote exactly. Yeah. I, I right remember what was back in the 80s, date myself it's a now, convention. When, when Reagan mm -hmm. showed up at a convention early once, right. which was like, oh, right. this is amazing. Nancy's right. giving the speech, and there's the image of Ron right. over the shoulder. Correct. They're saying, well done, yeah. Nancy. What, what does it say? Well, uh, when the nominee uh, enters the hall, okay, or a popular former president enters the hall, both sides of the aisle, it's a very memorable experience. Right. It normally doesn't happen right. until later in the convention. I don't make much of that because we don't have gavel-to-gavel -gavel coverage anymore, right. like we all grew up on, where we could turn on the tube mm -hmm. on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday night and see the entire because some, the because some Exactly. Right. Nobody's right. 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 I, 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 I will make something about this tonight. Yeah. It was yeah. to remind people that this is, about, this is Mitt Romney's convention. So, no, interesting that, point. Yeah, so, in other words, there, there might have been, see there the might have been, <laughs> there the might have been some concern, minutes. perhaps, oh, that been, this speech yeah. would be so strong that we don't want to have Romney disappear for too long, lest right. the image of right. Christie so be too Christie strong. Right, so is talking to think, Romney uh, about right. Romney, so he's always there. I think it's the opposite, though. I think the, the issue is that, first of all, Mitt Romney does not need any more gravitas. He's got that. He's got this very serious demeanor. He's an accomplished business leader, accomplished politician. Uh, you know, and, and I think with that, this humanized him a little bit. If you noticed, if you notice, Mitt Romney did. pointed to him and said, "Thanks, yeah. Chris." Mm -hmm. It was a very personal yeah. moment that they shared. He I did think seemed to get a little emotional there. I think he did. I think it's genuine yeah. emotion. This is a real guy, and you know, actually, Bill, you said it. it's a condensed format too because you've only got three days right. but look the reality is that the times have changed and yeah. people want to identify more personally with their political leaders. a little more approachable this, this way well yeah, and also in terms of the emotion the helicopter right. it would have been too much well in terms Absolutely. of the emotion too i mean yeah. this guy has spent the better part of the last six or eight years going for this and suddenly he's sitting right. there on the very day that that he's actually received the nomination of his party right. and they and, and suddenly this abstract goal yeah. has become a reality. I, right. I, I, yes, I give uh, the governor all the credit in the world for what he accomplished tonight, okay? Uh, having the delegation deliver the nomination, the positioning on the floor, the governor giving the key, I mean, that's tremendous. It, it, very few life experiences are gonna, you know, eclipse that perhaps. He even got a hotel upgrade. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> or on the beach. But, yeah. but Michael, the thing that I'm, churning. He's talking to 30 million people for the first time, okay? They might have read about him or heard about him. I'm not sure that this is the first impression that I would want to give. Why? Because I think Jersey's special. You know, we're straight talkers. Mm. We have diners. You know, we, we, we like to mix it up. He's perfect for New Jersey. The question becomes, I give Barack Obama a lot of credit for his keynote in 2004 because it was inclusive and it was bringing people together. This speech, the impression I'm left with, is too strident and too divisive and too we're right, they're wrong. Well, you could also no, argue, though, Bill, who could you not? Accomplish but Obama, Obama was coming in as a legislator with lofty goals and social uh, for social achievements. Christie comes in as a guy who's you know, an executive who's actually implemented policy, so they're coming from entirely different sort well, of... Well, but let's that. talk about I context. Think so. I don't, I don't yeah. agree with you. I mean, for Democrats, absolutely. And this is what you said before. Democrats, hardcore Democrats, I hate this. Hardcore Republicans, I love this. So what about the independents who see these 15 or second, 30, 30 second cl too. clips? Right. Yeah. Out of this, not the whole speech, just the clips, and the yeah. clips are going to be great. They're going to be awesome. They're going to be terrific. The line about the teachers' unions versus the teachers. Yeah. Chris Christie yeah. tonight redefined that entire battle. If you yeah. ask folks when that battle was going on, they say, "Oh, that Chris Christie doesn't like teachers." He yeah. had a national stage and tonight to start. redefine look, look it. Look back and to some other speeches, like really? in, well, well, like in 1992. What's, what's a snarky give to me in a sentence or a phrase? What's that speech? That speech what is. It? is a sentence or a phrase. It's, it's the adult supervision speech. 
Yeah, the adults that's, are that's in the room to, to, to take control the of the economy fruits. from this the inexperienced guy to take come out. I mean, somehow that's the line, it. right? Yeah. Yeah. To What's take that? our country back. Take the yeah. country back. Yeah. It's the slogan. It, it's what we talked about before the speech, that he set this very broad theme and talked, and he weaved it into not only his experience in New Jersey and his successes, but I thought, I would disagree, I think this was not only not a divisive speech, but defining us and them was about ideas. It wasn't because, remember, he talked about seniors. He talked about all these but, constituencies. But let, let, me, let, me, let me ask you this, though, Bill. Yeah. Not divisive, but when you say take the country back, who, who are you taking it back from? Well, there's an election. There are well, only I mean, two there choices. are some subtle overtones that some people that's are not uncomfortable with. Yeah. But I think that's a positive thing. But, but he talked for a minute about how he got it done yeah. in a blue state. But, he did. but, but yet yeah. he said, my lasting impression is, our ideas are right. Their ideas are yes. right. That's bull. That well, is bull. You know, okay. we go you're back to... Well, you know, <laughs> but you know, I, Bill, you so know, Bill, 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 every you democratic know, idea but, but listen to is what he, wrong. But, no, but wait a minute. Listen to what he said. He right. said that... That's great, well, you, don't expect him, leaders, you don't expect him to come out and say, he said, our ideas are great, theirs are only okay. You know what? No, and that's why people yeah, love him. Yeah. That's why his approval rating yeah. is high in New Jersey, and that's why he's received well. That For independence, that's not going to read that way. It's got he. It's a it's a political convention. It's yeah. a partisan convention. He's right. got to say, you know, we've got the better ideas. Right. Now he said, your ideas have failed, and are, now it's time yeah. to try ours. I think that's perfectly acceptable. It doesn't, and it's not. Well, it's not a strident, well, snarky right. attack. Got, on guys, let me ask another issue here. Hold on, hold on a second. The other thing I want to move on to is we're talking topics here right now. He used the phrase shared sacrifice. Who's, uh, what, is, what, what does he mean by that? What, who's going to sacrifice what? Uh, uh, you know, we've had the big battle about taxes here, and a lot of people have said to him, well, you, you know, the kind of tax uh, break that you're espousing is going to basically mean more sacrifices by people, you know, below the Not 1%. if he had gotten the 10% yeah. across the board tax cut that he wanted that the Democrats in the legislature blocked. How would he have gotten that? Sure it's it, but, wait a minute, wait a minute. You know, remember, 80% of small businesses file as individuals. So, yeah. He didn't get it done because Steve Sweeney and the Democrats right. blocked it. Oh, wait a right. second. Absolutely. But, but That's Barack right. Obama, it it's yeah. all his fault well, he had when two, he can't get a jobs program oh, wait done. Wait a minute, wait a minute. But wait. it's oh, Steve no, Sweeney Barack and Chill Obama Obama got is, his stimulus, and guess what? Anemic growth and unemployment over 8%. And so are the voters. The voters are a lot smarter than this. The voters are not Patrick looking at this speech in sound bites without context. There's context here. There's a ton of context tonight. There's context. Uh, Of course. And the context favors the Republican ideas. Do you feel Um, good um, at the end of that speech? Do you feel good? Not only do I feel good. Patrick, do you? Chris, I I got to tell you something. I think Chris Christie's a great politician, and I said it. I'm objective. I'm not some talking head for my party. All the time. But but, but as a Democrat, (laughs) would you not feel better if the speech were worse? (laughs) No, it would have been great if he bombed. I got to tell you something. I got to tell you something. I went through a pretty incredible experience this year in my own family with regard to politics. Yes, you did. Absolutely. You have to earn it. Chris Christie gets that. He's a Jersey guy. But I don't feel good when the other guys screw up. Yeah, it might be to my benefit. I feel good when my party does the right thing, when they stand up and do the right thing. And um, the American political system is broken. I think Christie knows it's broken. I think he would have gotten a lot more broader credibility. Listen, I he's going to do great. I the Republican the Party is, is going to shower no, him with praise and love. But he, deservedly so. And deservedly, it was a great speech for and, the and Republican Party. If he gave the no. speech that America is broken, no, for the country. It would have been about Patrick. Is Patrick, not broken. Patrick, you've got the if numbers. He gave that tell, speech. tell me what the numbers say about how a speech like this is likely to resonate. Uh, it's going to resonate at the margins. At the end of the day, it's it's at the end of the day, it's going to be what we remember about Chris Christie. Um, and if he gave the America is broken speech. It would have actually been see, It would have been actually negative for That's Chris Christie because, Carter because, because yeah. no, 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 yeah. no. He'd no, be he could, mourning he in America got, and it, because it would have been. I'm the only guy who can fix it because he really can't push that on Mitt Romney oh. because Democrats and Republicans have both both broken it. Shared power. Which which is a speech that he's given in New Jersey, but it wouldn't play in this. But convention, he did allude which is to right that. Say, in the he's not saying the same he thing. He did mention in the speech but, that both sides are responsible for some absolutely. of this, and he did say I just, how we got there. Hold on a sec. He did say. How we got there doesn't matter right now. What yeah. we do from this point That's out right. matters. So then we then we go 
uh -huh. into the area of policy. Right. Right. And if the and if the idea is a bipartisan approach, and we're going to look for new solutions. We're going to you know work together. Mm -hmm. and, uh, that's not a, that's not a losing message, is it? No. Right. And hard but, choices. Right. And bipartisan Wait, you cooperation. That was the message. <laughs> His message. The you that see, we message. all got something. Out. His message, Michael. I'm sorry. But I'll take a quiz. I'll let the professor quiz me. It was not. Let's all get along and work together. No, he said after, yeah, I've come, after they win. No, he yeah. talked right. about what he did in New Jersey. And then he said what stuck in my mind. Right. Their ideas are wrong. And he's and and you know what? The American people are ready for that kind of tough talk because they don't hear that from politicians. Let you know, remember, me, the look, I remember the way talk. Wait, let's just that is tough talk. Their form was a product, we hey, just said look, it earlier, it, of a look, Democrat. The, the Steve Sweeney. The are competing for the top job. And right. the only way you defeat an incumbent, this is what Chris Christie learned when he ran for governor. This guy's taking this state down the wrong path. I've got the right ideas to take it down the right path and recover. And you know what? It worked in New Jersey, and we're on our way. I mean, we talked about the job creation is starting. There is a recovery. Well, here's where the Democrats talking about that tonight. Bill, Bill this, well, this will true, go back to what we were talking about with, with your dad's race earlier. Uh, a lot of the speeches earlier this evening, the Republicans were very keen to point out how President Obama has departed from some of the policies that they suddenly find themselves liking from President Clinton, from LBJ, from JFK. Uh, it, it goes back almost to that, that element of who's the progressive. You know, we don't like the progressive. We want mainstream, we want midstream. Can this speech help them dive back to the... Because everybody's no, no, been waiting the, for the, the dive the back the day, to the At center. the end of the day, the party does not line up behind what the keynote speaker says the party's going to stand for. So in, in one sense, I'm going to agree with Bill Pascrell over here in, in that... It was an our ideas versus your ideas speech. And for those voters in the middle, um, they're going to say, you know what, we've seen both ideas and we don't think either one, either party has, has the monopoly on ideas. And in fact, in, in most cases, both parties uh, fail at ideas. What's going to come out about this is that Chris Christie is a guy, at least hears his ideas. Right. And... He sticks to his ideas so that at least we know what we're getting. And if we agree with them, we agree with them. If we don't, we don't. Let me ask and you so what it gets a, back to the question you asked me at the beginning. Is what's going to be the impact of the speech? Right. Nothing. Not it's not, <laughs> it's not going to help Nothing. Mitt Romney so one way or the other. These posters really, are because so it's cynical. cynical. It's just, it's just, well, then, it's just then, the way it plays well, out. But then it, uh, and you kind of led me to where I wanted to go next. When all is said and done, and this convention comes and goes, and the Democratic convention comes and goes, will any of those images matter at all, or will it all be the paid advertising that a bunch of people donating to a PAC or a super fund that we don't even know about? Is it It that? was those tweets that, from yeah. the Obama campaign that you mentioned that were happening during this. It used, right. to be, used to be during conventions, the other party would take that time off and, and, and seed the floor. Right. Right. And, and obviously right. we're not in that environment right. anymore. That's it's true. going to be these attacks, these individual attacks, because um, I heard Steve Forbes the other day just said, this is one of the most important hours, this in the debates. Mm -hmm. And I said, no, it's, the debates are going to be important because they're going to be sound bites that come out of that, unscripted. But uh, it's going to be the ads are going to be more important than anything that we see here. Because that's when, when these swing voters or these voters who haven't decided whether they're going to turn out decide exactly whether it's worth their while. I think people have checked out on political advertising, they've checked out on direct mail. This is now about something very different. Can they get an impression from a guy like Governor Christie tonight and then what they will digest in subsequent they've days out on will that, form their this. opinion? What's that? They've checked out on no, that. No, they're going to watch the Today <laughs> Show tomorrow, they're going to watch Good yeah, Morning that's, America, that's they're going to watch NJ Today, and they're going to say, wow, that's a clip I like, that's a clip mm. I don't and like, two, and they're going to form an impression. Now, that, this this, this planted history. the seed. Yeah. But those clips are going to continue to run. And if, if the Republican Party builds on those themes, you've got plenty of successful Republican governors across the country that can point to some of the things Chris Christie said and drive that message home. And if that becomes the dialogue, and, and I think actually it's very telling that the Obama campaign was tweeting negatives during the speech. I think it's, it is, it's below where they should be operating for an incumbent president. Are you going to say that next week when uh, Mitt Romney yeah. can't yeah. the same thing? I you know, you're, Mitt Romney's yeah. not going to get down in the mud. I don't, I don't I really, that's why he's got Paul Ryan. I don't disagree <laughs> with your, your point about uh, paid media. Okay, but we know it works. All right, we know it works. Uh, people are turned off by it, but it does work. Well, otherwise, work. people you would tear somebody down. Candidates works wouldn't be paying keeping, for it. The, if it didn't down, work, sure. they wouldn't pay for it. It works by right. keeping your opponent's soft supporters home. 
That's well, what it does. But it, it also can have the potential to suppress the vote. But isn't yes, that, guys, guys, here's yeah. the key it question. Your opponent I wanna, soft hold on, hold on. Here's, come out here's what I want to ask you right now. Ultimately, isn't that the stuff that's being paid for right now that's coming from a variety of sources, which usually is nothing more than, at this stage of our political evolution, attack ads and stuff that denigrates, isn't that the stuff that ultimately drives so many people out of the political process because they figure, I don't like him, I don't like him, I don't like her, I don't like her, because all the messages that they get right. now are and, these and, negative messages. And the reason messages. why candidates run this, uh, campaigns run this, is because at the end of the day, it's all about turnout, as your father <laughs> knows very well in that campaign. And the best way to, to maintain turnout is to, or to control turnout, is to make sure that you suppress the vote of your opponent and know who you can count on in your but side. Not, not but Barack not Obama the had the opposite the effect in 2008. We don't want any negative ads. But, but Mike, Barack <laughs> Obama yeah, had the joke. opposite Guys, effect. Hold on, Phil Spadey. Barack Obama had the opposite effect in 2008. He energized people, and instead of suppressing vote, he brought people out. And, and I think that you've got the same opportunity now. You look at this Republican convention and the governors that were speaking tonight, you had a very relatively younger crowd, you know, younger folks that were up there speaking. Mm -hmm. This is a new generation of Republicans. I think they're going to, they're speaking to the issues that people want to be talked about in terms of job creation, whether you're a woman or a man or black or white. And I, I think they've got to now stay consistent with that. Part of it is hurting the other side. But look, we, we've seen this in election after election. You can't just run on the negative. I mean, if that yes. were true, yeah, Mitt yeah. Romney would be doing much better right now. He would have had some kind of a huge bounce coming out of the primary after yeah. he trashed everybody else. But it's about the positive. But can you go high road and win anymore? I think you can. Yes. Yeah. I think you can. I think you have to. I think you can. And you I to. think that Mitt Romney is making a colossal error in not... It's maybe I'm too into this, we're too into this, but I still don't know, other than telling me what he's against, what he's going to do, what he's for. Maybe we'll but hear when it he the gives debates. his speech. When maybe he gives we'll his hear speech, it. yeah. Maybe we'll know. The big winner tonight, in my opinion, is Chris Christie. And the reason he's the winner is purely political. Because I think every Republican major donor and benefactor in this country will be moved by that speech will be impressed by that speech, and will want to be a part of the Christie, you know, phenom. Okay, Bill Spady, final remarks. Uh, Chris Christie did an outstanding job tonight. I think he reflected well on the state of New Jersey, and I think he really put the party in a very good light that will now appeal to independents because he didn't have the harsh negative tone. He really presented the positive. Patrick, about 15 seconds. Yeah, I, th I think Chris Christie did a terrific uh, job tonight for himself, but at the end of the day, this is not how voters are going to decide in November. Gentlemen, thank you. Appreciate it. Great panel, as always. And we thank you for watching. We will see you again tomorrow here on NJ Today, 6 o'clock, complete coverage of the aftermath of the governor's speech. Till then, I'm Mike Schneider.